right. Um, I think we're going to start. Um, I think it's six, right? Or my, yeah, it's six. Okay, I want to welcome everybody to um, what is the first talk of our um, movement migration and memory series that is part of the Hostile Terrain 94 exhibit at Butler University. Uh, my name is Achet Slaus and I am a professor of history at, um, in the uh, Department of History, Anthropology and Classics at Butler. And I will take a couple of minutes to, um, to introduce the exhibit and to introduce the exhibit coordinator um, who will then tell you a little bit more and um, introduce our fabulous speaker that we have for this evening. So um, about Hostile Terrain 94, it's currently going up in the library, in Irwin Library. If some of you have been there, you might have been able to see that already. We've had um, a number of workshops filling out the toe tags. And so for those of you who do not know about the exhibit, it was, um, came about by the idea of the um, anthropologist, Jason Le Leon, who was working on um, both archeology span and ethnography of migrant life and death on the border. And um, he wrote a book, The Land of Open Graves, um, an award-winning book. He is also had, excuse me, he also heads up the Undocumented Migrant Project, um, which is basically a laboratory and, and research um, clearinghouse where he um, is trying to humanize um, the severe humanitarian crisis at the border. And so this exhibit um, was thought of by him, it's a way to raise awareness about the humanitarian crisis, to raise awareness of the consequences of particular kind of immigration policies. And um, it consists of a large wall that depicts as a representation of the Arizona um, Mexico border where the majority um, of people have perished. And then it consists of 34 handwritten toe tags um, that document the loss of life between the mid nineties when this policy prevention through the turns came on and um, 2019. If you want to know more about the exhibit, we'll put um, some links um, to the events and to the exhibit in the chat. Um, I also want to tell you a little bit how we're gonna do this. So um, in terms of the BCR, um, Christopher, who I'll introduce in a minute, will be posting the link for you, um, I think halfway through um, our speaker's talk. And then I will look at the chat for your questions that you might have for Dr. Shiroki. Um, you can type your questions there. I can even ask them or I can ask to um, have you unmute yourself and, and ask the question directly. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce the coordinator of Hostile Terrain 94 at Butler University. And might I say, uh, the work in the last few weeks, this exhibit would definitely not be there if it wasn't for him. Um, his name is Christopher Baez Arena. He is a major um, at Butler in social justice, um, in theory and practice. Uh, it's an individualized major and that he's navigating. Um, he's very active in a number of different student organizations as well. And he is serving as the um, main clearinghouse worker for the GHS um, special projects. Um, so um, I'm very, very happy that Christopher is part of this project because again, without him, it probably wouldn't have happened. So um, thank you, Christopher. And um, thank you also Dr. Shulay Shiroki for being here tonight. Thank you everybody. Thank you so much. And. Um... I am very honored to take on the uh, Hostile Terrain uh, 94 exhibit as a coordinator. Um, as I was mentioned in a workshop today earlier, it is something that is very dear and personal to me um, as somebody who did experience border crossing. Um, and I do like the opportunity to be able to express and to be, it's kind of cathartic and to become, um, and to become engaged in this work. Um, I really find it uh, rewarding in all sense. And so for beginners, um, 
I'm going to go ahead and do a land acknowledgement. If you're not familiar with a land acknowledgement, um, it, it is basically an acknowledgement of the indigenous communities that were present here. So we recognize that Butler University exists on the traditional territories of several indigenous groups. We honor the indigenous communities native to this land and acknowledge that debt we owe to their past and present knowledge of conflict transformation, sustainable peace and restorative justice practice. We also understand that acknowledgement by itself is a small gesture. It becomes meaningful when coupled with authentic relationships and informed action. We are committed to developing relationships with indigenous individuals and communities locally and globally and to offering events on decolonization and indigenous rights, knowledge, and movements. And I am going to introduce Dr. Shiroki. And Dr. Shiroki is a professor of anthropology in the Department of History, Anthropology, and Classics, and an affiliate faculty in race, gender, and sexuality studies, peace, and, peace studies, international studies, and global historical studies. She's busy. Um, she holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of California at Berkeley, and uh, Dr. Shiroki's scholarship focuses on explorations of power as manifested in an intersectional and discursive expressions of gender, race, body, age, religion, and ethnicity, or urbanity, and social cultural frames of differences. Her research projects are highly transnational, spanning from Iran, France, the UK, the United States, and explore the intersections of gender norms, sexuality, and displacement, diaspora, and other force movement. Most recently, the crisis of re refugees in Europe and the political north. Her publications echoed the breadth and depth of this work, ranging from articles on art of, ref of and by refugees, creativity and aesthetic and political protest in Iran and across the Middle East, to gendered reading of visual politics of the body emerging from contemporary Iranian protest scene and alternative sexualities and lifestyles among young Iranians in the US. Her writing on Iran aims to diversify representation of people, while remain, remaining critical of strategies that exclude others. And before we begin, I am gonna go ahead and share a slideshow here. And to verify if I can have a couple of thumbs up to see that you guys see all that, perfect. Dr. Shiroki, go ahead. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Dr. Slaus, for your amazing work. You're, you do all the heavy lifting. I just show up to the party. Um, I know that um, a great number of people have also been um, essential in putting this wonderful poster together that we're looking at, including um, the beautiful Hummingbird logo that uh, my friend, uh, uh, young artist, Aiden Slaus Casper has put together. So I want to acknowledge in the spirit of recognizing and sharing uh, the honor and the responsibility of bringing to awareness these important questions. I, I want to uh, uh, appreciate and name um, Christopher, uh, Aiden, uh, Gina Reese from uh, the core, uh, Amy Arnold from our own department, history, anthropology, and uh, classics. And a shout out to all of my students who are here. I can't see you at the moment, but I know you're there. So I really appreciate that after listening to me all day long that you show up again. Thank you. And of course, Dr. Slaus, thank you. Without your work, without your commitment to bridging the theme scholarship that you have worked so hard on and uh, your teachings and building the Butler community as a more inclusive and more re relevant place, um, I wouldn't be here uh, talking tonight. So thank you all around. What I'm going to do is um, with uh, everybody's permission, I'm going to read uh, a 10 page paper that I have and uh, in the background, Christopher is going to be my uh, technology guru here. You're gonna see on a loop, uh, a series of images that I've put together. And um, even if they pass, we're gonna come back to them. And during the QA afterwards, if you have any specific questions and you want us to go back to a specific uh, slide, I'm happy to do that. So these slides are not wall decorations. They're actually meant to be in connection with what I hope to have on offer today. So without further ado, if I may, I'm just gonna go ahead and read. Christopher, is everybody hearing me okay? Thank you. 
So let me begin by uh, talking about art in strange places. On August 2nd, 2019, the celebrated public monument Make Way for Ducklings in the city of Boston became the site of an art activism installation by Karen al Zayer that awakened public senses on the state anti-immigration policies and the human cruelty it entailed in practice as practiced by caging migrant children in detention centers. The selection of Make Way for Ducklings sculpture, which is also no known as the Mallards, as a site of protest by the artist, signals to aesthetic power that public monuments have on our shared sense of memory, political, uh, political and sociocultural ethics and ethos. Despite the proliferation in the production and circulation of migrant images in the media, visual representation of border crossing subjects, that is refugees, migrants, and the displaced, remains essentialized as an unwanted, quote unquote, other, whose corporeality, mobility, and visibility is perceived to destabilize cultural integrity and political economic equilibrium in the North. In the last two decades, Europe, the UK, and the United States, leading the immigration rhetoric in the political North, have ramped up circulation of a narrative of, quote, refugee crisis, unquote, perpetuating hierarchies between citizenship, legally sanctified migrations, refugees, dispossessed, and the undocumented migrants. Visual culture and mass media in powerful political regions of the world have largely echoed these hierarchies of belonging, drawing on the spectacular stories about border crossing and its impact on the host country. That is the country that they're presumably arriving in. Not included are the multitudes of everyday life experiences seen from the perspective of the displaced migrants themselves subject to overlapping structural forms of violence from poverty to war to environmental crisis and political persecutions that informs their particular journey across the border. The erasure of the border crossing stories from the ground up presents an enduring dehumanizing effect on the perception of migrants while sustaining exclusionary strategies to restrict migration across the border that are informed by hegemonic ideas about distinctions in race, age, gender, religion, ethnicity, and, some, and similar frames of exclusions. The history of the border between Mexico and United States, for example, is unmistakably uh, linked to the growth of American industrial capitalism and its reliance on cheap labor. While immigration was tied to systemic industrialization, it had regional, ethnic, and racial characteristics. The degree of undesirability of immigrants varied by racist attitudes towards new arrivals from Europe and elsewhere. Uh, my students, for example, in class uh, can tell you about the importance of going back to these moments in history and in, in contemporary and recent American history in, in particular, when the Irish uh, and the Jewish uh, mass migrations uh, through Ellis Islands uh, in New York uh, were perceived and produced as um, the new blacks. That doesn't mean that they, the African-Americans were being elevated in that light, quite the reverse. It uh, spoke to the undesirability of the newcomers. Um, but all the way to the gas, uh, gasoline bath uh, and the treatment of the fumigation treatment imposed on the Mexican migrants working in El Paso, Texas in the 1910s. Paradoxically in the US, while the state programs and intergovernmental agreements were deployed to the building of the nation and its capitalism, systemic visual representation of the immigrant other as produced and circulated in print media uh, perpetuated a social Darwinism uh, view of inferiority of the non-whites. The interconnected history of class, racial, and cultural divisions against the labor migrant uh, 
from Mexico to uh, El Paso, Texas, for example, during the US industrial expansions of the early 20th century, exemplifies the paradoxical treatment of migrants from the South as both necessary and unwanted. Thus, the current narrative of code protecting the border against the threat of disease violence, racial, and cultural impurity that is presumably embodied in the figure of the migrant other has a long and painful history often omitted from the mainstream discourse on migration and border crossing politics. However, media is not the only platform for public engagement with the notion of migration and border crossing. Ideas about the dispossessed and migration migrating bodies are sy systemically produced and reinforced through political economic apparatuses that monitor the world's large scale mobilities through transnational and governmental organizations designated to control the border. In the aftermath of World War II, multiple organized bodies for monitoring and management of refugees and migrants have taken the lead in establishing an official language codifying the experience and legitimacy of migration paths around the world. Assimilation programs operate on a series of presumed essentialisms about the uniformity among categories of the dispossessed. The categories of dispossessed, I mean the distinction between refugees, the displaced, and the migrants. Racialized assumptions about cultural differences and linear perceptions of the concept of development, privileging technologies and policies perceived to enhance modern subjectivity. Concurrently, academic studies drawn, drawing from anthropology, history, transnational law, post-colonial theory, international and peace studies, among many others, have provided critical inquiries into the formation of migrant other by examining an assemblage of epistemological studies of the border, its impact on the global political economics, as well as gross structural inequalities and disciplinary processes that inform human migration. Migration studies focus on the importance of distinguishing between legal categorizations of refugees against other forms of immigration and displacement, evoking the idea of involuntary migration across the border. That is, the assumption is that if you are not, if your life is not threatened by, let's say, political persecution, then perhaps you're, uh, you're choosing to cross the border, you're choosing to be an immigrant. Anthropology, by contrast, considers the lived experiences of migration on and around the border. Border ethnographies humanize the narrative of migration by way of diversifying the experience of the of dispossessed and provide for a, a more uh, for a more poor heterogeneous analysis of the specific intersecting histories that inform movement across boundaries of belonging, including crossing over the border. Moving across the border, Lisa Malky reminded us, is not equivalent to the loss of culture memory nor identity. Seen in this light, border itself is a form of symbolic boundary distinguishing zones of belonging, whether it's national, racial, economic, or otherwise. And the border crossing experiences are carried out beyond the physical geography of a politicized planet. Beyond established institutions of knowledge productions about border and migrants, um, like the United Nations, uh, government policymakers, humanitarian agencies, and the world of colleges and universities. Today, a growing number of artists activists offer a poignant repertoire of creative and visual culture on migration and border crossing experiences, enabling a more inclusive engagement with questions about the porous nature of that boundaries between zones of distinctions and corporeal technology, technologies of visibility and or concealment of movement across these borders. Art in general and contemporary visual art productions that interrogate the story of migration in particular 
have the power to bring to focus a human story of border crossing, to make visible that which has been concealed from the normative narratives of migration, and to disrupt presumptions about hierarchies of mobility and privilege in belonging across the globe. In a world where countless mediators in public eye represent unfolding stories about the formation of migration narratives, a transdisciplinary human-centered approach to the critique of border as the site of control in migration and resistance strategies to its hegemonic presence in our collective consciousness is necessary. In what follows, I examine, I examine an assemblage of critical inquiries connecting between art and anthropology of migration to illustrate how constellation of transdisciplinary engagement with the border provides poignant critiques of systemic anti-immigration political per perceptions, policies, and practices in the North that conceal the humanity of the migrant other. This interdisciplinary approach to the study of the border challenges the current rise in xenophobic discourse about migrant other that dehumanizes the displaced by stripping away the diversity of perspectives, aspirations, and subjectivity of those enduring the harrowing journeys across these borders. In examining a recent act of protest in caged ducklings, the connections between art activism and its power to make and unmake collective memories of migration is unpacked. Interrogating the putative xenophobic sentiments against migration art, art provoc provocateurs on what Apoderai calls, quote, ethics of possibility, unquote, in the future of humanity. An installation series entitled Gateway, migration art activist Zach Hackman rewrites the story of border crossing to bring to life myriad of, myriads of disciplinary technologies imposed on the immigrant body, ranging from the violence of surveillance, affective consequences of waiting, isolation, and death while traversing over the border. So let me begin. Understanding the monumental power of art. Beginning with the story of the caged ducklings, that's the one by Al Zayer uh, in Boston in 2019, I suggest that art offers a powerful medium for critical engagement with the notion of migration and permeate beyond the physical site of the border as a line on the ground to open up a more visible and inclusive space for public deliberation on the topic. Created during the Cold War, the Mallard sculpture was commissioned by the city of Boston to be built by the sculptor Nancy Schoen in 1987. Schoen's inspiration itself came from a classic children's story by the same name written earlier in the century by Robert McCloskey that tells the story of a pair of migratory Mallards in search of a new home to raise their ducklings who find refuge in the city's public garden. The historical context in both works of art, that is the text from 1941 and the bronze sculpture in 1987, further reveals the interconnections of the aesthetics with the political. In 1941, prior to its official entry to the war, the United States had begun its engagement with Euro in Europe by supplying war material to allied forces and through international strategic agreements like the control over Iceland or the uh, Euro First project with the UK. During this period, the US foreign relations with the UK and the allied states fueled a steady rise in the American sentiments towards a more empathetic perception, reception of the European escapees from the war. Schoen's sculpture, and I should say sculptures because she first uh, was commissioned by the city of Boston and her first work, uh, the Mallards, was uh, built in 1987. And during the reign of um, Ronald and Nancy Reagan in office as uh, in, the, in the White House, that is, um, through the mediation of Nancy Reagan uh, in 1991, Sean did a replica of the statue uh, uh, for Moscow, which is in Moscow. 
So Sean's sculptures too reflect the political climate surrounding migration, refugees and border walls at the end of the Cold War. Decades later, the story of the Mallards is yet again queered in response to political climate of its time as Al Zoyer puts individual cages around this sculpture. Caged ducklings, that's how she calls it, caged ducklings separate separates the iconic migrant family by placing physical barriers around the migrating family of Mallers, rendering them inaccessible. Al Zayer then separates individual birds from one another, building the next layer of distance as a direct protest against the 2019 separation and detention of migrant children by the state, particularly those with Latinx roots from the country south of the United States border. Although cage ducklings was removed quickly by the park's authorities, the circulation of its image on media, mainly local, but also regional media and national media, had a profound impact on public discourse against the immigration politics. By evoking the image of migrant children in detention centers under a sheet of mylar, that's that shiny stuff that uh, comes in, in case of emergencies they, they give you. By placing the, uh, the migrant children in detention centers on, uh, under a sheet of mylar, which is designed quote, to provide warmth but not comfort, unquote, the artist activist redirects public discourse on immigration policies from the rhetoric of exclusions to the politics of care. The transformation of the story of the Mallers through a genealogical analysis of its development is demonstrative of the scale and scope of how art and migration are interconnected. The systemic invisibility of migrants in the political North is indicative of the presumed distinction between insiders and outsiders. In the context of contemporary neoliberalism that derives global connections, a hegemonic assemblage of a legal, political, economic rubric geared towards maximized freedom in profit-making practices has situated migrants in a precarious position of liminality in terms of belonging. A product of modern subjectivity, citizenship, which is often marked by a documentation processes, uh, granting one's legal visibility in a nation state matrix of belonging is deemed as the ultimate status for inclusion in the political North, creating a hierarchy for those who fall outside the boundary of state supervision. Thus migration from the political South, which is often instigated by structural violence in labor, political and social relations is paradoxically deemed as both a characteristic of globalization, thus normalized, while migrants themselves have become the embodiment of quote differences, unquote, that is differences in morality, cultural and racial uh, makeup, if not gendered that potentially pose a problem to the perceived political economic stability in places such as the United States and Western Europe. Migration studies often examine structural policies and practices that contribute to generating specific groups and experiences in refugees, economic, social, and political displacement. Three decades ago, writing against the dominant threat trends in categorizing migra migration experiences, Lisa Malky offered an anthropological critique of the policies and processes of assimilation of the migrant other in the host country. In her book, Purity in Exile, Malky offered an anthropological perspective on how experience of violence and dispossession are remembered as narratives that, I, that identify the subject beyond the border. Focusing on diverse historical causes and myriad of responses that account for the heterogeneity in border crossing experiences among the Hutu refugees in their journeys from Burundi to Tanzania, Malki's migration ethnography connects the border to the larger transnational policies and practices and perceptions that restrict the lived experiences of refugees to a legal category as formulated in the aftermath of World War II. 
Contextualizing the historical continuities between past and present, Malky's writing stands as a poignant example of how anthropology provides a long view of citizen making technologies beyond the perspective of macro political to include the stories from the ground. Through listening to immigrants' own notion of what it takes to belong, border ethnographies offer a human-centered critique of exclusionary policies that we see in extended detention of migrant children in the US and the dehumanizing practices such as destroying water supplies left at the US-Mexico border for immigrants, which are designed to render the migrant other invisible. Returning to the idea of border as that which divides geographies of belonging beyond the territorial lines drawn by powerful states, the marginality of the migrant other does not end after crossing over the defensive lines and security checkpoints that presumably permit her entry into the new life. Through an assemblage of everyday life encounters, borders are drawn around the identity, language, and the body of the migrant other that simultaneously locates her within the boundaries of the host country while designating her as an outsider. By offering a visual narrative of immigrants' everyday experiences of invisibilities, contemporary artists activists revive the discourse of migration through its affective and visceral experiences of loss in home, in dignity, uh, in kinship, and in sociopolitical recognition. This is why I have many examples of uh, the art um, products that uh, challenge those invisibilities. By um, Iranian artist Shahram Karimi's uh, The Bed and the Suitcase from 2017, for example, embodies the convergence of memory, home, and migration as it informs the cultural identity of migrant other in the North. Reflecting on autobiographic memory of his own displacement as an Iranian refugee in Germany, Kadimir writes of the perpetual reviewing of the experience of what he calls escape and his arrival in the host country of Germany years ago when the bed became the symbol for shelter, stability, and home, while the suitcase remained in the corner as an important icon for migration and the journey across the borders. Intersecting critical theories on corporeal technologies from concealment, that is technology to pass, to hypervisibility like protest in public uh, scale, as acts of and towards inclusion with, deliberation, with deliberations on creative forms of agency and imaginative representation of migratory journeys, I suggest art to offer an invaluable perspective and presence toward a more inclusive and human focused representation of the lived experience of immigration and the larger body of studies on the borderlanders. By borderlanders, I'm borrowing this from the scholarship that talks about those who either uh, directly cross the border or are very uh, immediately impacted by as their houses or their jobs uh, requires them to be right on the border, if you will. Anthropology brings to focus the human in the, in the po uh, politics of border crossing. Migration studies in the political North have largely focused on legal notions of citizenship that were inform informed by nation state configurations of border territories preceding neoliberalism of globalized market economies demand for a type of code flexible citizenship. Such a myopic view of citizenship ignores the importance of a sociocultural agency and the cultural citizenship. This is coding uh, the work of Rosalto, Renato Rosalto from the 90s. Uh, the cultural citizenship that includes practices, memories, and beliefs produced out of negotiating the ambivalence of the relation with the state and its hegemonic discourse on belonging through national identity formation. Recognizing the power of the visual, many contemporary artists activists 
portray an image-based narrative of migration and border crossing journeys to disrupt the monotony of the dominant discourse that dehumanizes the story of migrant other arriving in the political North as a threat to national security and cultural integrity. Art interventions produced either by the immigrant artists themselves, of which I have many examples for you to look at more closely after the paper is finished, um, or artist activists position in a range of visibilities provide a migrant centric visual repertoire that challenges normative ideals about citizenship and otherness. Seen in this light, art is a powerful medium to resist modes of concealment and to open up the stage for increased public visibility of everyday life experiences in border crossing and displacement. Migration art produced but from the perspective of the migrants disrupt the homogeneous discourse of quote security unquote in the state of and the state of exceptionalism that is the response to the fear of terrorism that is often evoked to sanctify border control and exclusionary immigration practices, um, such as the caging of the families. Bodies across the border, the art of movement under surveillance, an impactful example of art as provocation into migration discourse is Gateway by Israeli artist Zach Hackman. Gateway is an interactive art installation built in stages that began with a small prototype to the full scale installation made from steel bars and turnstiles that are molded after border security checkpoints in Israel. Taken out of its geographical context and placed inside an art gallery, the, viewers experience, the viewer experiences Gateway as a standalone apparatus uh, and in the artist's own words, code, a checkpoint without border and a naked architecture with no authority on code to survey movement. As a work of art, gateway installations evoke questions about the visibility and opacity of border crossing, bioproduction of otherness in relation to the regulated and unregulated border crossovers and the corporeal violence of the gaze as it is imposed on the movement under surveillance that creates hierarchies of power between those within the confinement of the gate in contrast to those outside of it looking in. Built in life-size scales from solid durable material, that is the steel bars, Hackman's gateway are a critique of the notion of visibility and the perception of impenetrability of the border. Unlike a wall of concrete and a sheet metal uh, used to barricade the, used to barricade to prevent movement and visibility at the border, steel bars, par steel bar partitions allow for a degree of visibility between those inside and those outside the gate, paradoxically highlighting both the impossibility of an impenetrable border, as well as the emphasizing the liminality of the border as a gray zone that is in between spaces of authority and authenticated nationalities. Gateway offers a visceral experience for the viewer to participate in and out of the realm of seeing and being seen as they move through the spatial divisions that give meaning to it. Hackman's Gateway further demonstrates the violence of, quote, waiting. It reignites the visceral memory of my own border crossing experience in recent years from Morocco to Spanish territory of SEPTA in 2009, 2019, where hierarchies of waiting between those who could cross, those who hoped to cross, and those who never did were most palpable. Put differently, waiting is indicative of an unequal power relation between those who wait and those who make us wait, and the heterogeneity of the experience among those in waiting. In, other, in the words of Khosravi, quote, to keep people waiting without ruining their hope is an exercise of power over, the, over other people's time, unquote. 
At a socio-philosophical level, Hackman's gateway is a critique of the violence of the waiting gamut that distinguishes hierarchies of power around border crossing. From the aspirational gaze of those inside the gate in anticipation to pass through, that's the liminality of the bodies that are in motion, but not quite in motion, in movement, to the privileged few who monitor and code authorize the movement across, that's evoking ideas about biopower, bio surveillance technologies, and observing the observer, the structural violence of ethno-racial inequalities of border politics could not have been made more palpable than in this art project. Art has always been political, whether informed by a specific ideological political economy or in protest to the frames of power, art emerges in a specific time and place in connection to power relations that inhabits its world and makes its meaning. In the aftermath of the leaked images of torture in Abu Ghraib pr prison, for example, McClintock argues Quote, we need to see the historical continuities of torture that, haunts, that haunt US history from its inception, unquote. Not in a linear uh, history, but to render visible con continuities of imperial torture with the carceral violence in the national prison system and the rituals of military training. In other words, I think that we cannot talk about the immigration detention centers uh, that ICE um, either directly or indirectly um, operates in this country, but without thinking about the uh, detention centers as a subcategory and in connection to both the history of racism and with respect to um, border crossing in the US, but also in uh, connection to the larger prison industry, particularly for-profit prison industries. So I'm gonna wrap up. We live in an era of image saturation where we are always looking at times without seeing. The visibility of the migrant other, like the sites, that is the locations, and the sites, that is the visibility of the border, takes on a multiple spatial and symbolic localities. As the borders are redrawn beyond the national geographies, the migrant other flows in and out of the realms of visibility. The migrant other can be traced through an assemblage of narratives, policies, documentations, like passports, um, like COVID tests, visual repertoires, and scholarship that gives presence and meanings to everyday experiences of the displaced in the political self, refugees and migrants in the political north, and the caravans of asylum seekers on the move. In recent years, artists, activists across many genres have produced some of the most poignant, disquieting interventions in the current discourse on migration in the political north that inter intermediates, negotiation, negotiates, even counters the putative image of the migrant and the displaced. For the past two decades, migration art has steadily risen in response to the anti-migrant sentiments and border control policies, denigrating the diversity and humanity of the experience of, the, of displacement for mass populations around the globe. As such, art has transformed the othering discourse through production of an aesthetic language that brings to life the heterogeneity in voices in migration stories, providing important counter narrative to the myth of the quote crisis in migration in the political north. Anthropology and migration studies have the potential to engage more critically with creative modes of inquiries to disrupt epistemology of othering and to rewrite the story of mobility and border crossing from the perspective of those who experience it firsthand as we embody a collective memory of migration through care in contemporary global movements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shiroki. Uh, this is um, very provocative and, um, and also hopeful. Um, 
And um, yeah, thank you for, for the very powerful insights and, and also very powerful images um, you know, of the art that you discussed. I want to invite um, our audience to ask you questions. And um, oh, I see a lot of applause emojis are going up, yay. Um, but I want, to, I want to invite people to, um, who have questions for, for Dr. Shiroki. Um, and um, I can either ask them or Christopher can ask them or we can um, ask people to um, unmute themselves. So there is one question from Max Ryan. Max, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, sure. Um, can you define uh, political north? Yes, thank you, Max, for that question. Um, yes, so I specifically talk about a language. This is not my, my language exclusively, but um, you may be, we may be more familiar with uh, a different kind of uh, dichotomized world um, represented in the West and the East. So that history is particularly meaningful all the way through the 20th century. And with the fall of the Berlin Wall and this idea that we're now living in a globalized world where the, the connections across different nation states and different uh, places for production of commodities, goods, and wealth, as well as knowledges and, um, and political and governmental powers has been shifting. So it's no longer this divide between the East and the West. Now, that's one argument. The language that I'm using is emphasizing not a geographical North, but rather a political cultural North that could be expanded in terms of these regions where there is more direct control over um, economic productions, over the military uh, might around the world and interventions, uh, and where there is more job opportunities, where there is the first batch of vaccines available, where there is more um, the access to travel and passport. Uh, and, and less visa restrictions and so forth and so on. So it's a, it's a language that tries to relocate the, a different kind of hierarchy that exists in the world. That although we were told that globalization was gonna democratize the world, was gonna equalize the differences between those who have and ho those who don't have, in reality, and many decades into the process, uh, it's quite evident that um, while globalization has enabled uh, revolutionary and speedy types of connections across many borders, it also has perpetuated and escalated many of inequalities, structural and symbolic inequalities, so that we continue to have political north. If you want me to give it some um, country uh, locations, the United States, Canada, uh, the UK, many of the Western and Northern European countries, Australia, Japan, China, uh, Russia, uh, Israel, these are often referred to as the political North. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Dr. Shiroki. Um, any other questions? You can also just raise your hand. I think we, we have a manageable group here and unmute yourself. I have lots of questions, but I want <laughs> you to be able to ask your questions before I completely dominate the discussion. Um, anyone? Dr. Edwards. Uh, mute myself. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I'm sitting up in Dugan Hall on the second oh, floor. Yeah. <laughs> Mask. Anyway, <laughs> good to see everybody. Um, I had a question about the art pieces and yes. um, kind of about the question. It kind of connects with the discussion of visibility and invisibility. I'm wondering if you could say something about the placement of these um, art pieces. Absolutely. Um, how these immigrant artists make decisions about 
you know, who they imagine their audience to be, where they place them. Cause I see that there's sometimes we put, there's pieces that seem to be placed close to the border, to the places that they're speaking about. And then other things might be far from those places. So I just thought I'd be curious about kind of those kinds of decisions. I think that's an absolutely brilliant observation because I try to include a few examples. Obviously there's hundreds and hundreds of artists that are producing brilliant work. Uh, Christopher, I'm wondering if you would be kind enough to maybe share the slides, but not as a loop, but maybe we can go to certain examples from the slides. So uh, we're here, so I'm just gonna uh, say that uh, this one, which I introduced at the beginning of my paper, was already a public monument. And uh, as I try to articulate, this public monument was, I mean, it was already coming as a political, with a political message. And of course, Al Zayer is not the only person to have been um, using this public uh, display of, as a political site of protest. I think I might have another example here if I could go to uh, slide seven maybe or eight. So that's Al Zoyer's piece. If you go to uh, the next one, this is the original one. If you go to the next one, this is the Black Lives Matter. So people do engage with public art that's already on display and already um, uh, in existence. Of course, that's not all uh, the uh, political art and protest art. Uh, the next slide, uh, slide number 10, is part of, so it's a couple of images. The art installation is the bed and the, the suitcases. This was uh, on a tour across several cities in Germany. And this was part of a, um, uh, part of a uh, exhibit. So this was not necessarily commissioned, but there was definitely a selection of the, the artist. So the art was being presented in terms of an, uh, an art space that people would go. It was free admission, but people would go. And, and in San Jose, there's a really good art uh, immigration art exhibit that still is going on. And it has been going on for a year now. So there are, are existing institutions where a lot of these arts are displayed. Uh, that's also true about the next slide, the next two slides. This is Hackman's work. He is a professional artist also, and he has had these uh, as part of larger exhibits in uh, art galleries in the UK, in uh, New York, and in um, and, uh, uh, Europe. Um, I'm hoping to bring him to Butler if my time permits. However, if you keep going further down on the list, um, on the slides, keep going down, I want to show, so, so right here, actually, if you go back up one more, this is not an installation per se, but Richard Mizrach is a San Francisco based photographer. And since 1970s, he has been interested in the US desert landscape. So he's been out there photo uh, photographing the deserts in the US. And then by the 1990s, he comes across um, the, the borderland, if you will, the pieces of the wall that are being, so it's also important for, I think, particularly our students to, uh, to notice that the wall was not built, that, I mean, the US-Mexico wall was not just built during the Trump era. In fact, this has been in place since the, uh, uh, two previous uh, presidential uh, terms. And, um, but it had been in bits and pieces and different companies have been hired and different mediums have been put in place and so forth and so on. So the smaller photograph that we see 
that's not an art installation, although it very much has the aesthetics of a sculpture. This is part of uh, an isolated part of the border, an actual border that he photographed in first in the 90s, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, he went back to it uh, in more recent years, I think during the Trump administration, uh, only to find that the grass was growing underneath it. So, I mean, the absurdity of that is uh, quite poignant because what what is that thing doing there, right? What is it keeping in or out? But then again, we have uh, in the larger photograph, these are uh, part of his photographic uh, exhibitions that he offers, he calls the borderlands. And then he has another series of uh, work that he does uh, under border cantos with another Mexican uh, sculptor, uh, musician, Guillermo Galindos, who they collaborate by collecting artifacts, actual pieces left at the border and found at the uh, border of Mexico. And they turn them into art and or they photograph them and they catalog them, sort of like what Jason de Leon is doing, although perhaps in a different direction. So there's a whole list of things. And if you go further down uh, a few slides, I want to more uh, introduce more contemporary towards the end of the series. Okay, so from here again, yeah, sure, why not? Let's click on number 20. So here is on the bottom left, my left, the slides, uh, that's an actual photograph of um, Syrian and Kurdish uh, uh, asylum seekers running towards the border uh, in uh, the, towards the border with Czech Republic, I believe. Um, and that image uh, kind of evoked uh, for me already two existing, two other existing works of art. Um, so you see these uh, cautions, these uh, pseudo traffic signs that were, uh, there are actually artists uh, uh, projects put in place uh, in the 1990s. Um, and uh, then in the flyer, in the poster for this talk, I included a Banksy rendition of this, which is basically this uh, stenciled uh, on the wall in um, San Diego with the addition of Banksy's signature red balloon, which the, uh, the little girl is holding. So the idea of putting the art in public reach, put, making the art accessible, whether it's on the side of the highway near the border, whether it is to photograph the border and bring it to the museums or bring it to the uh, virtual space for people to have access to. Or if we go further down a couple of slides uh, more, I think the last slide is an example of how this other artist, um, Yemi uh, Cam Cambron, she lives in Atlanta and she is a professional artist often commissioned by the city of Atlanta, as well as many other uh, organizations in the region to actually paint public murals like this one that we see. So we can find them everywhere is what I'm trying to say. And that's intentional. There is also a whole series of art that's inspired by the uh, experience of uh, an icon iconography of the border and and border crossing like the the bottles that I had a few slides up uh, again Mizra has photographed an actual bottle which you see um, so these are water bottles makeshift water bottles that that one on the lower left and um, it's wrapped up in a t-shirt to so that it doesn't heat up as quickly in the desert, but also so that they can't be spotted uh, easily because of the reflection by the border control and or the vigilantes that they call themselves the minute men of the border. Um, and to the right is actually uh, the artist's uh, rendition of, she's inspired by that iconic, the uh, bottles that are left at the border which speak to volume to the tragedy of lives lost 
and also how uh, border patrol goes systemically and destroys the bottles. So there's none left for other people to reuse them. So she creates these glass jars uh, in, as kind of refined uh, art that often is um, uh, situated inside the museum. So it's in uh, art world rather than public domain per se, but yeah. I don't know if I answered your question, but what they share, they're very different and there are very different political economies attached to them. But what they share for me here is that they do bring the border closer to the non-borderlanders, if that makes any sense. There is a question from um, Dr. Dano. Dr. Dano, do you want to unmute yourself and share Did your you thoughts? For a great, Dr. Shroki, thank you for a wonderful talk. It was so provocative and thoughtful. I really appreciate it. Um, so I was thinking about Max Ryan's question and thinking about the, the use value of a framing of the political North and like, what are the possibilities that it misses things, you know, in terms of like homogenizing whole spaces and peoples. Like, so when I think about the political North, it, you know, we think, oh, it's the US, it's this, right? But there are many US's, right? And so like the very spaces that you're looking at. And so I was thinking like, you know, is a, tr a frame for it might be the borderlands of the political north, right? And those don't have to be limited to a space, a geopolitical space that we normally might think about of like a, uh, a place where documents are demanded to be produced in part because those spaces have grown so much under ISIS ability to demand 100 miles of a border, which is over two thirds of the country, your documents. So it doesn't have to be at El Paso anymore the way that it used to be. It's, you know, here in Indianapolis, we can make those demands on people too. So I'm just thinking about the way in which the political north might be one kind of framing and one kind of, um, I guess, way to organize and think about it, which is the definition of a frame. So I'm sorry that I repeated that, but <laughs> like one kind of framing, but like, it, what are, what's the use value of that versus the risk in your, right. in your esteemed assessment? I will. Oh, I don't know about esteem. No, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for your kind words. That's exactly right. That's exactly what I was trying to um, bring to focus that, uh, Often um, when we uh, hear or when we speak about crossing over the border and migrants or refugees, there is this presumed distinction between the North as a uniformly uh, stabilized and economically prosperous and so forth and so on in contrast to her other, which is the South. And so uh, all of these things are, uh, I've written them in with quotation marks around them precisely because just as uh, 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 beautifully you articulated uh, so eloquently how the political North, huge, uh, but even the US itself is heterogeneous and is experienced very differently on a daily basis that not everyone in uh, the US is um, of the same identity or experience and or accessibility. Um, not everyone in Indianapolis. I mean, we do have refugees living amongst us. We do have um, um, immigrants amongst us. I am one. Uh, we do have different degrees and different experiences of um, being immigrant and experiencing and and or uh, being visible as an uh, immigrant uh, and i don't want anybody to assume that or the, to think that i assume a uniformity about indiana indianapolis in the us and or the political north but that is precisely my point that there is these presumptions, there is this lingering and perhaps outdated language as a frame of um, mind, as a frame of uh, critique and a frame of uh, knowledge production about us versus them. And so is the language of the self and so is the language of the people who are on the move from the self. 
Uh, another dimension, another um, misrepresentation about the crisis language and the crisis perception of refugees is that um, it is everybody from the South, it, whether they're escaping a war or famine or uh, earthquake or um, what have you, political persecutions, they're flooding into Western Europe, they're flooding into the US. And while United States does benefit in at as a large entity, it does benefit with certain privileges that many parts of the world do not have and they dream about it. So the allure of the American dream still is uh, in existence around the world. But majority of people who are displaced um, cannot afford it nor ever make it beyond it neighboring countries. So if we're talking about uh, North Africa or the region that's called uh, North Africa or, or the Middle East, by far majority of uh, the displaced are housed in the neighboring nation state. Um, and very few uh, do actually uh, make it into the uh, European zone, if that. Uh, so you're absolutely right that uh, there is a problem with the way that we have uh, seen the world in this divided zones of the West versus the East and or um, the North versus the South. Uh, it's far more complex than that. However, there are certain privileges that have become more uh, prevalent in places like the United States uh, in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, education, in terms of a degree of uh, passing, uh, the size of the population in the United States and the size of the country in the United States is quite significant. And for, uh, and, and then the complex historical, which you know better than I, the historical politics and political relationship of the U places like the United States to the rest of the world. So when the Haitians show up at the border to the US, there is a degree of that fantasy about the, the desirability of the US. And uh, there is also uh, the complicated and painful races uh, history of US in, ha in Haiti and so forth and so on. So, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question or not. There's what point also, taken? Um, I think you did. <laughs> um, there is also a question from Dr. Mold. Dr. Mold, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Shalay, thank you. Um, what a great talk. Um, just a treat to get to hear some of your important work. Um, yeah, so my question was really about the art forms. It seemed like the primary dialogue that the artists were engaged in was very introspective, very reflexive in terms of kind of a modern art, um, whether it was on the street or not. Um, even the street art, there's a particular ethos there. And um, it actually what occurred to me was the, the installation with the bed and the suitcase and I noticed the quilt and I just wondered are any of these artists drawing on folk traditions whether their own or traditions of the migrant uh, communities that they're depicting. Thank you, yes, and I have to um, I have to admit that I happen to overemphasize the visual uh in the art uh, of course there's a lot more than just um public monuments and or graffiti and or uh sculpture and or photography um there's just so much you can say in 10 pages so i've been very uh careful not to just get carried away but um in another place i do um put together uh, examples from um poetry from um, um, quilts and or tapestries that are not really tapestries in the traditional. Okay, so let me give, give you an example and maybe I can pull up that uh, image in a minute for you. But um, uh, an Iranian artist uh, who lives, I believe in Germany, uh, she puts together these uh, 
quilt-like tapestries that are uh, created, they're sewn together and they're uh, put together from calling cards. So these are the cards that also connects her to over the phone lines to home and family, but it also are stitched together, quite literally are stitched together as she then writes a story on the edges. She stitches a, a story on the edges of this tapestry and this quilt uh, that kind of adds another layer connecting her to her grandmother and her grandmother's grandmother. So that lineage of hand, hand uh, creations, handmade creations that have become part of who she is and how she sees herself and how she sees her art as both connected to the contemporary world of art in, the, uh, in where she lives, in, in her new life, in her new home, but also as a lineage, as a heritage connection back home. Um, when we were a couple of years ago, when we were um, Butler students and Dr. Deneau and I were in uh, Germany, uh, my students and I, we went and visited with um, an artist activist, among many other things that she's capable of, a poet who, uh, Lahya, who has an embodiment of how non-uniform these uh, lived experiences are. So she was born in, um, uh, in South Africa as a black child. Right. And she was adopted by German white parents because, um, well, because her mother put her up for adoption. The father had to uh, go to another country on as a migrant labor migrant and never return home. So she grew up in uh, East Berlin. This is the West Berlin, West Germany, East Ber Germany world and by these German white couple. And until she was uh, 20 or so, and then she went back to South Africa and uh, reunited with her, um, uh, with her birth mother. And then she returned to Germany, this time as a united Germany, and she continues. So she is queer, she is, she, def uh, she identifies as a disabled person. She is black, but she's also raised as white. She has like, and she's a poet. And so her poetry and her writing is autobiographical always, but they're also very much um, meant to disrupt these uh, boundaries, these categorizations of identity that we tend to come to. And there are many, many others. I just happen to have focused on some of the visuals, but thank you for that. Um, not seeing any other questions in the chat, but if anybody has one, I definitely have one that I'm sort of burning to ask. So if nobody has a question, I'm gonna ask my question. Yeah, is that okay? So um, yeah, thank you for, for such a really great talk. And also I am with Dr. Mould. Um, it's it's a really a wonderful to be able to hear directly about your research, um, which is fascinating. And I was wondering, and it sort of brings me a little bit back to Hostile Terrain as an art installation, a pop-up art installation, interactive. But when I look at this, and it's so powerful, right? And, and, and if you are just unpacking these discourses of power, then definitely the artists that you, know, you um, identified and, and whose work, that this is a counterpower. This is a way to, to offset these, these dominant images that we're getting and, and, and language and news reports. And a lot of the time, you know, the crisis and things that are portrayed as factual, but you know, would, I'm sorry for lack of a better term, could also be sort of this, this kind of rare, strange poverty porn and, 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 and this, this kind of stuff, right? Um, very sensationalistic usually. And so how do you think for you, your artists who you know, are also separated across the globe by these national borders, but how do we how do we make this more visible? You know, because I think if I go to a museum, I get to have that experience. If it's public art, hopefully I get to be on the street. 
I know with social media, maybe there's more of an opportunity for people to share their art that way. But I'm noticing even at Butler for us, you know, to, um, to promote this um, exhibit, um, you know, of course we want everybody to participate and, and that's, that's not easy to do. Um, and I don't think that's only about dominant discourses, but I do think that's maybe a part of it. So I'm wondering the artists that you see, maybe yourself as well as an artist and a scholar and an activist, how do you go about that? Thank you, Dr. Slaus. So I don't know if I have a really good answer because um, I think part of my, um, you mentioned the optimism that I try to include in, in this paper is because I'm hoping that um, more, uh, more academic and more systemic attention is given to this kind of intervention. I think that there are plenty of scholars that are taking this up, but um, like many other parts of um, academia, we also see a lot of silos in terms of production of the story, production of knowledge. And that also permeates in the between art as a separate discipline in a separate world of its own from, let's say, social sciences, which is my world, right? But I do see that this is beginning. And part of that um, transdisciplinary is having meetings like this, I suppose. But part of it is uh, actually to have um, to, to recognize the value in each other's work. So um, the fact that a work of art uh, can reach uh, through it, the language of aesthetics, can reach and connect with, the, with its audience on a different level than maybe uh, a, a, a scholarly talk or a scholarly paper, I think is, is a benefit, is a mutual benefit. On the other hand, I do think that um, while there are a number of really amazing artists that I've just come across and I'm like, I wanna bring them to Butler and I wanna bring them to Butler, but it's like, you know, it's impossible. But I do think that um, they, there is endless medium and endless ways to be creative, to be engaging with the question of uh, migrant other. Um, in a creative and, and thoughtful and critical way. So it, there, is, there doesn't need to be, we don't need to perpetuate that hierarchy that already exists in the art world, that there is the art that belongs to the museum and then there is the street art that's edgy and they don't, you know, when you put Banksy's work in, in, um, in the um, art market, then it, you take away from his street cred, right? Unless he becomes more savvy and he disrupts that, then there is more street cred and so forth and so on. So that still is going on there. That's still very much part of, and, and if Dr. Wang is here, he can speak to that better than I. There is a huge hierarchy between museum and galleries and or uh, street art and graffiti art and protest art. But the fact that there is more public awareness, there's more accessibility to art through graffiti, through street art, through hip hop, through spoken words, that has enabled larger scales of people to recognize the power of that medium for intervention and, and to engage with it, to experiment with it. So, I'm very impressed by the young and becoming experimental artists, uh, perhaps even more than um, some of the more professional, more established artists like uh, Ai Weiwei or others. I mean, they, they have managed, that's why I was talking about variation of um, uh, positionality between these artists. Some of these artists are themselves immigrants, some of them are in detention centers, like that ramen noodle packaging uh, photo frame that or picture frame that uh, I included in the slides is done at the detention center by the detainees. So some of it, so for me, art can be a lot more than that which the art market mediators tell us it can be. So uh, I'm 
I know that the um, Black Lives Matter mural that was painted last year as a part of a protest or in response to um, the uh, growing violence, uh, systemic violence against uh, African-Americans is being paved over. So what are we going to do about that? Do we, does the city have an alternative plan? Is there going to be a space dedicated? We have so many murals that are uh, important to the history of the city, it appears, in terms of the wars that we've engaged in. Uh, how many, by contrast, peace murals do we have? How many inclusive murals we have? We have some, but if we need to pave over certain mural that was just put in place, can we push back? Can we bring in? Can we take, uh, like, take advantage of these little fissures, these little openings, and then bringing? And and I don't know if I'm the right person to 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 do that, but I think that there's plenty of um, creative minds and and uh, brilliant artists uh, among Butler students, among people in Indianapolis and beyond who can. Uh, push back and who can demand for more of that to be present, more of that to be part of our um, public space. That makes any sense. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think um, if there are not any more questions, um, if anybody wants to still ask a question, the final comment, um, I think that, um, we're gonna close for now. Thank you, Dr. Shiroki, for a wonderful talk, very provocative. I know that we will be talking because <laughs> I have so many more questions. Um, and, um, and thank you so much too for heading up our series and, and mm -hmm. going first and, um, and being willing to do this for us. Um, thanks again. Truly an honor. Thank you so much. And thank you, Christopher. You did a brilliant job. Thanks thank everybody you so much. for your patience. Thank you. Okay, good night, everybody. Please keep on checking out the hostile terrain um, events. Mm -hmm.